and in today's presentation, I'll be uh, talking about the, the recent project which I was involved in at Ipsens AI, uh, where we were working uh, on the problem of multi-object tracking of people in surveillance videos. Uh, in the talk, I will describe our objectives, uh, our uh, problems we had, um, the solution we came up with, and uh, the conclusions of our uh, research. Uh, so let me briefly introduce myself. I work as a data scientist at Ipsens AI, where I have a chance to apply um, a variety of AI methods to the problems from the fields of computer vision and NLP. Um, in particular, today I will be uh, describing the project on multi-object tracking. Um, at the same time, I'm, um, I'm a PhD student at the Warsaw University of Technology, my past academic background is in automatic speech recognition, but currently I'm focusing more on chatbots and dialogue systems. Uh, at Deepsense AI, we are a team of data science experts. Uh, we turn our expertise into AI-powered solutions uh, for our clients. Uh, we are a team consisting of uh, data scientists, data engineers, software developers, DevOps engineers, and business-oriented managers. Uh, we have a proven track record of uh, more than 50 commercial AI projects in uh, multiple branches of industry. We work from, uh, com for companies from all over the world, uh, both for large companies and for small, smaller ones like startups. Uh, we also conducted some uh, R&D projects, including the, the ones in cooperation with Intel and Google Brain on reinforcement learning and generative adversarial networks. Uh, as a team, we guarantee the world-class skills in computer vision, NLP, and predictive modeling. Uh, let's move to the main part of the presentation, and let me briefly introduce you to the topic. Uh, so our objective in the project was to develop a proof-of-concept system for uh, tracking people who are in a shopping situation, in a shopping environment, and they are being recorded by a so-called CCTV camera. Uh, or actually multiple CCTV cameras, uh, also known as surveillance cameras. Uh, th these people are mm, moving around the shop. They are looking at the uh, objects uh, on the shelves. Some of them are waiting in the queue, while others are uh, even uh, are uh, shop workers like cashiers. Uh, so this example here is quite a crowded shop, uh, a small one, but full of people. Uh, who we would like to be able to um, follow in their movements. Uh, so let me rephrase and define the, the problem of uh, multi-object tracking, often abbreviated as MOT. Uh, it can be seen as comprising of the two steps, first one being the object detection. So we want to find objects of interest in a single image, in a single video frame, uh, which means we want to predict uh, their position, their location, and draw also bounding boxes around them. In our case, the objects were uh, people, they were of class person, but in general, the object can be of any uh, kind. Uh, once we already have uh, detections for a given video frame, we want to assign them to so-called tracks. Uh, a track in abstract term, uh, which represents the same object across multiple uh, frames of the video. And based on some defined uh, distance metric, we want to assign the detection to detections to tracks. Uh, let's move to the overview of existing tracking algorithms. Uh, the ones which I will be describing belong to a, a specific uh, class, a specific paradigm of tracking called uh, tracking by detection. This is quite a modern approach uh, which uh, works well thanks to the advances in object detection itself. Uh, so first, uh, the first algorithm which I would like to cover is called SORT, although it has nothing to do with sorting. Uh, it's just an acronym that stands for Simple Online and Real-Time Tracking. It was introduced in 2016 by Billy et al. And it was designed uh, to be targeted towards online and real-time tracking, which means that the tracker only considers the previous and the current frame when doing the assignment. And uh, it was designed to be as simple as possible uh, rather than trying to cover all the possible corner cases, it uh, ignored, for example, visual information uh, of the inside of the bounding boxes. And the detection to track assignment relied completely on the intersection over union of uh, bounding boxes. 
For object detection in the original paper, they were using faster RCNN architecture. Uh, maybe it's not uh, the point of this presentation, so I will not go into much detail about uh, faster RCNN. Uh, but another very important uh, element of the tracking uh, algorithm uh, in sort was usage of Kalman filter framework for motion estimation. Uh, I have a separate slide uh, for Kalman filters, so wait for it. Uh, for the assignment of detections to tracks, uh, they used the Hungarian algorithm, uh, which is a minimum cost assignment algorithm uh, based on a cost matrix. And in this case, the matrix was based on IOU values. Uh, let's move to the already mentioned Kalman filter. Mm, this is actually one of the most widely used estimation algorithms and you can understand estimation quite broadly here. This is an algorithm that operates in a, in a loop, which consists of two steps, predict and update steps. Uh, first of all, it produces estimates of, of hidden variables based on some measurements. And then uh, based on the past estimations, it provides a prediction of the future system state. Uh, so in order to use the Kalman filter framework for your estimation problem, you have to define uh, at least two, two things. Uh, the first one being the system state, which is a vector of the target parameters that you want to model. And the other one is the dynamic model, which is a set of equations uh, describing the dynamics of your system, which means the relationships, relationship between the input and the output. A very good explanation of the Kalman filter um, framework can be found under the link which I provided on the slide. Uh, when applying the Kalman filter framework to motion estimation in MLT, it's typical to uh, estimate the state, to model the state uh, as an eight dimensional vector where two coordinates represent the bounding box center position. Another coordinate represents the um, height of the bounding box. And the fourth one is for the aspect ratio. Uh, the following four are the first derivatives of the first four um, parameters. And there is uh, one uh, state vector for each uh, tracked object. Uh, a very important assumption that is uh, used in this uh, framework, uh, used for example in sort and the following algorithms as well, is the uh, assumption of constant velocity motion. Uh, as you can see on the animation, uh, it may be fine for tracking pedestrians because uh, approximately they, they are moving with a constant velocity uh, on a straight line, they follow a straight line, but maybe it's not necessarily the optimal um, choice for describing the dynamics of uh, people uh, moving around in a shopping scenario. But as I said, this was a proof of concept uh, project. So for this phase, we just stick to the uh, constant velocity motion model as well. During the uh, detection to track association step, uh, this state uh, estimate, is used uh, when calculating the distance between the track and the detection. And the track is uh, represented by the bounding box that is the estimation, the estimate of, of, of the state in the next frame. Uh, the next year in 2017, an extension of sort was introduced and it was called deep sort. It was actually the same group of researchers who just uh, extended their original sort uh, algorithm with uh, visual information. So now the association metric combined both motion information and appearance. By appearance, I mean visual features, uh, which were uh, embedding vectors obtained from a convolutional neural network that was trained with a classification objective for classifying uh, people. And uh, its goal was to learn uh, to extract some visual representations of, of bounding boxes. Uh, these representations were vectors extracted from the penultimate layer of the network. According to the authors, this uh, should have should, should result with better handling of occlusions, uh, which are the situations when uh, one person is being covered or hidden behind another person. Uh, when they, their trajectories cross each other, this should result with uh, less uh, identity switches. So uh, that's uh, the reason behind adding this visual information as well. And, uh, Another concept introduced in deep sort was a gallery, uh, which is a, let's say a list of the past, the history, history of uh, these embeddings for each track, which are kept for a fixed uh, 
number of frames and then forgotten. And when doing the assignment, uh, the nearest neighbor uh, match is, uh, is performed uh, between the um, gallery, uh, between the features kept in the gallery and the ones extracted from the new um, video frame. Uh, another algorithm is quite uh, brand new. It's from this year. It's called Fair MOT. Uh, it's different, uh, slightly different compared to the previous uh, ones because it has a single model which combines uh, the two tasks of object detection and the extraction of visual um, embeddings. So object detection and re-identification are in a single model. Therefore, it's called one-shot tracker as opposed to the two-step uh, methods described before. It still relies on the Kalman filter framework and according to several MOT benchmarks, it's the current state-of-the-art um, algorithm. Uh, if we already have our, our system and want to evaluate its performance, its quality, uh, we have uh, actually quite a lot of metrics to choose from. Uh, there are more than 20 of them defined in the benchmarks, so I have not listed all of them on the slide, just uh, selected the most important ones, uh, being uh, the uh, MOT accuracy, MOT precision, and identification F1, uh, respectively. But the MOT accuracy is the measure of how well the tracker um, detects objects and keeps their trajectories independent of the precision with which the objects are uh, located, estimate, their locations are estimated, uh, in contrast to MOTP uh, precision, which is the measure of error of uh, estimated position for the um, pairs of objects and uh, hypotheses. Um, this is quite counterintuitive, but uh, although it's called the precision, the lower the value, the better. Uh, and IDF1 is basically uh, an F1 score measure for uh, how well your, mm, our model performs uh, in terms of re-identifying uh, the same person across multiple uh, video frames. And these metrics are mm, implemented, for example, in this PI MOT metrics uh, library module. Mm, it's very useful. It was very useful to take it instead of implementing from scratch because it's uh, quite a. It doesn't really make sense to reinvent the wheel in this case. Uh, so let's move to our uh, particular scenario, our case study. So as I already mentioned, we wanted to track people who are moving in a shopping environment, who are moving uh, around the shop. Mm, we also wanted to add support for. Uh, simultaneous tracking across uh, multiple, across several car cameras mounted in the same shop. Uh, if a person uh, moves from one from one camera to another, uh, he or she should still be tracked. Another problem we wanted to tackle was to create a 2D map visualization to represent the people motion, the people's motion, uh, not only with bounding boxes but also with uh, markers on a 2D uh, map on the bird's eye view of the shop. Uh, and last but not least, we wanted to detect actions performed by the moving uh, customers, moving people, uh, who we, we uh, came up uh, with three actions, being uh, walking around the shop, waiting in a queue or paying, and being rather a cashier than a uh, customer, uh, respectively. So now uh, let me uh, talk about the data. We did an uh, intensive, extensive research on the data sets uh, before starting the project, we found quite a lot of uh, data sets to choose from for all the components of the pipeline, for person tracking, for re-identification specifically, and for action, action detection too. So it seems there is quite a lot of uh, choice. Uh, but on the bad side, we uh, found out, we came up with, with the conclusion that actually none of these av available data sets was perfectly uh, matching our uh, needs because some of them were of too low resolution, like the Caviar dataset, which is quite uh, quite old already. Mm, other datasets were uh, recorded under different uh, conditions in different environments, like corridors or offices, while others uh, were about uh, tracking pedestrians who mm, have for sure different walking patterns than people who are shopping. Uh, so what we did instead, uh, as we stated that it was not easy to find the representative data for the problem, we, uh, for the POC project at least, decided to use uh, footage from CCTV cameras that we found on YouTube. One of them being the 
shrouded shop sequence, which I've shown you in the beginning of the presentation, and uh, another uh, three uh, videos coming from some uh, scene that we uh, named multi-camera shop. These were, uh, this was the same scene uh, shown from different cameras mounted in the same shop. Uh, and the videos were almost synchronized. So it seemed uh, very, it seemed to uh, finally match our needs, but there was one problem. The data was unlabeled, unannotated. So we found CVAT, uh, which is the computer vision annotation toolkit, uh, part of the open source OpenCV library. We uh, used CVAT for manual labeling of bounding boxes, tracks, and actions with some uh, semi-automatic labels, uh, some aut automatic labels uh, obtained with the object detection for bounding boxes, but then we had to label the tracks and actions uh, manually. Uh, so this slide shows what I mentioned and uh, what we named the multi-camera shop sequence. As you can see in the first few seconds, there is a, uh, there is a guy who's wearing some uh, yellow shorts. He, uh, he disappears behind the shelf uh, to reappear once again on the rightmost camera after a while. Then a lady enters the shop from the outside. She disappears behind the shelf. Another gentleman enters. They meet inside. She goes to the uh, cash desk. Uh, after some um, seconds or after a minute almost, this our uh, yellow short friend uh, reappears at the cash desk with Coke and newspaper. Another person enters the shop and so on. In total, the sequence is uh, 95 minutes, 95 seconds long. Uh, so, as I mentioned during the overview of, of, of existing algorithms, uh, one of them was deep sort and another was fair MOT. We experimented with both and didn't really see any significant differences in terms of performance on our data on the multi camera shop sequence. And we decided to stick with deep sort as our, uh, let's say, starting point for the code base which we customized because DeepSort's code was much cleaner and much easier to uh, customize than fair MOT. Uh, we coined a new name for our algorithm for our custom version of DeepSort, a very witty and funny one, DeepSense Sort. Uh, so for object detection, we used YOLO v3 network here as it's supposed to be faster, more suited for real-time applications than, for example, region-based uh, approaches like faster RCNN. Uh, so we trained the network on the crowded shop sequence plus a uh, carefully selected subset of the multi-camera shop sequence. Uh, we made sure that no person was present in both the training and validation uh, subset of the data uh, in the multi-camera shop. Uh, we also added some more features to Dipson sort. We uh, added the possibility to define, to predefine uh, areas in each camera, for each camera where new tracks may appear because uh, without this feature, we were noticing a lot of uh, false positive uh, new tracks uh, being initialized in the middle, out of nowhere in the middle of the shop. So we only wanted to keep, um, let them appear uh, next to the entrance uh, or exit or by the camera borders. Uh, we also added support for multiple cameras uh, tracking, uh, which uh, means we were also uh, having a purely visual uh, comparison without this Kalman filter framework for those detections and tracks that were not matched with Kalman filter um, and embeddings to uh, match uh, objects across multiple cameras. Uh, and also we added uh, information about the 2D coordinates of each bounding box as additional information, uh, additional component of the association metric. I will say a few more words um, about these 2D coordinates in a while, it has not yet been covered. Uh, for re-identification, re this was the um, component that we were most uh, unsatisfied with. Um, the original deep sort embeddings didn't really work uh, when a person uh, changed, uh, moved from one, cam one camera to another or uh, disappeared behind the shelf and reappeared, uh, but facing in a different direction. Uh, it could not uh, really um, recognize it's the same person that it was uh, a moment ago. Uh, we experimented a lot with different uh, extractors, different uh, features like ORB, LOMO, also uh, applied this fair MOT embeddings to DeepSense sort tracker, but nothing really 
satisfied us in this uh, dimension. So uh, uh, another component was this action detection uh, component. So for each tracked person, we wanted to tell the model to tell us what he or she is uh, doing. We had three classes, which were, as I mentioned, walking around the shop, waiting in a queue or paying at the cash desk or not being a customer, but a cashier. Uh, for this purpose, we used the decision tree classifier with some feature engineering using features based on X and Y position, the between frame translations X, uh, along X and Y axis, proximity to other objects, other people, and also proximity to the a predefined position of the cash desk. Uh, we achieved uh, we achieved satisfactory results, which you can see uh, as the numbers on at, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, for the problem of, of creating a 2D uh, coordinate visualization, a map, uh, we uh, we uh, used a so-called homography transformation, uh, as we wanted to mark each detected person's position on the map as a marker. Uh, this is a transformation that uh, trans transforms uh, each pixel uh, from um, one from one uh, plane to another. These planes being the floor surface seen from the camera and the same floor seen uh, from the bird's eye view on the 2D map. Uh, so this required estimating the transformation matrix, the homography matrix, and this transformation, this calculation of, of, of this matrix requires mapping between at least four pairs of corresponding points in these two images. Uh, so we had to manually uh, point uh, pairs of, of points or pixels that correspond to each other on the floor or, or any other characteristic uh, spots uh, in the picture. Uh, so for each camera, we separately pre-calculated the transformation matrix that transformed the image from the camera to the same uh, global coordinate system for the 2D map. And therefore we had the combined map for the three cameras together. You can find the detailed explanation in the, uh, under the link which I provided um, for the homography transformation calculation and so on. Uh, highly recommended, very interesting topic. So the next slide will be about the experiments and the results, the outcome of our pipeline. So I'll put the full screen here because it's not um, uh, well seen, if, if not full screen. Uh, you can see the tracking, uh, the bounding boxes, keeping the color, me meaning the same ID is assigned to the track, uh, which works quite well uh, when the person is within the same camera or is still visible uh, in, the, in the scene. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, we were not uh, able to keep this, uh, these IDs after a person uh, entered the shop. It immediately, she changed the ID that was assigned to her. Same will happen after she comes back. Uh, this lady, this blonde lady, comes back uh, from uh, behind the shelf. On the right side of the video, you can see the uh, mentioned mapping, the, the, the visualization of the markers of, of people's position. Uh, these were calculated using this homography matrix uh, by transforming the coordinates of the uh, center of the bottom edge of the bounding box, which is more or less supposed to represent the uh, feet position of a person. Uh, these are being projected onto the uh, bird's eye view uh, floor in the, in the two, two D coordinates. Uh, yeah, so this is it about the visual, let's say, aspect of, of the pipeline results. Uh, let me explain why I put uh, no numbers for camera one, the external one. We uh, didn't, we have decided not to label the people who have not, uh, who do not enter the shop at all. Um, so it uh, introduced a lot of noise into the detection and tracking and uh, Therefore, it makes no sense to present the um, metrics here, but for the camera two and three, we labeled everyone present in the, uh, in the video. So um, the metrics are quite representative uh, and quite satisfactory uh, when um, looking at each camera separately. Um, so to uh, sum up the presentation, what we did was to, we developed a proof of concept multi-object tracking system 
which worked well enough. We were satisfied with the quality of object detection, single camera object tracking, uh, 2D coordinates mapping and action detection. But uh, the most problematic component which did not work uh, well enough was the re-identification in, in, in case when a person moves from, from one other camera, from one camera to another, or when the same person reappears uh, within the same camera after being hidden uh, for a while, and then is seen from a different angle, from a different uh, view. We have several ideas uh, to try to improve the pipeline, which we have not tried yet. First of all, we would like to take advantage of some human parsing models uh, to detect some key points, uh, some masks for body parts and clothes, but this could uh, potentially limit this real-time um, possibilities of application this, of, of this pipeline. So we have not tried it yet. Um, we, we could also try different approaches to re-identification, use some, for example, some Siamese networks. Uh, for the multi-camera tracking, uh, we could, um, we should probably uh, allow to merge tracks, or to assign the same track ID to um, two detections or, or more detections uh, seen simultaneously in multiple cameras if a person is uh, visible from different uh, cameras at the same time. Uh, for motion estimation, an idea for improvement could be uh, to um, get rid of this constant velocity assumption and try some more complex motion model. Uh, there is a lot of space for improvement still, but for us this was a very interesting uh, research topic and a proof of concept uh, project. Uh, this is all for now. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them during the conference or contact me later. Uh, via email. All right. Uh, thanks, Arthur, for the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Hi. Let's, let's confirm if you can hear me well. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Perfect. OK. Um, thanks for the presentation once again. Um, we have some questions. So uh, maybe let's start uh, with the question from Camille. Um, you mentioned a few met metrics. Are they the most important for this type of problem? Why did you choose these metrics, not the other um, out of 20? Because you mentioned there are over 20 metrics you can you can use. Uh, yes, as it was mentioned during the presentation, uh, in the papers on the problem of multi-object tracking, you can find uh, results uh, in terms of around 20, 20, uh, 20 metrics. and. Uh, I think I consider the ones where I, which I put the, on the slide the most, uh, let's say, representative ones if you don't want to get overwhelmed with numbers. They just provide like a, a general impression of how well your model performs because uh, the other ones like I, I, I can describe as, let's say, uh, components of these, of some subcomponents of these uh, metrics. So this, uh, as it was on the slide, uh, let me have a look. On this slide, this MOT accuracy represents the uh, uh, the ability of your mod of your system to keep track of, of the of the detection and the assignment of detections to tracks. Then MOT precision is about uh, how uh, precise your model is in terms of uh, locating the bounding boxes, how close they are to the ground truth, and uh, IDF one is is a selected representative metric for re-identification and others include, for example, the number of identity switches, number of false positive detections and so on. So they are like, as I said, uh, subcomponents that uh, also are reflected in the more uh, general metrics, which are the three uh, on the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a lot of experience with object tracking, so I've got a follow-up question. And, um, how do you get or where do you get the benchmark the right bounding boxes to measure the performance of your bounding boxes, uh, of the bounding boxes your model generated. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, it's about uh, how, where do we get the labels from? So the ground truth mm -hmm. information. Uh, as I said also in the presentation, we found a very uh, useful uh, tool called C CVAT, Computer Vision Annotation Toolkit, and we used it to annotate the data for uh, object tracking and for also for this uh, action detection. 
Uh, fortunately, the current state of the art in object detection is uh, so good that you can at least uh, try to produce some of the of the labels. Uh, you can you can treat some of the predictions of of some pre-trained object detection models as uh, labels, and then just fix the ones that you consider uh, wrong or uh, add some other new ones manually. So this is what we did. We we run a object detection prediction. Uh, with some model, which is also included in this uh, CVAT toolkit, uh, with just clicking a button, it applies object detection to your to your uh, data, and then uh, internally we uh, had to label uh, the track IDs for each uh, frame, for each bounding box, add some uh, bounding boxes manually, and also uh, label the actions performed by each person in each video frame. So this was quite time consuming, I would say around uh, 20 hours to label these uh, four short uh, two-minute sequences. So yeah, it, it took us uh, 20 hours to label, uh, to generate labels for eight minutes of video. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. That's the answer I, I just, I want to hear. Um, okay. And uh, could you say some, simply a little bit more on detecting actions of the customer? You mentioned um, paying, um, could you say a bit more on that? Did you use to the floor map to use to 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 detect the actions or something else? Uh, as I said, the the model which we uh, came up with and it was working well enough was based on a decision tree and some uh, features uh, that we came up with, like proximity to other objects, the position mm -hmm. of the bounding box in the current frame, uh, the translation in, in the position between uh, two consecutive frames and uh, also the proximity to the cache desk, for example, for detecting the action of stay, of waiting in a queue. Uh, it was quite easy to detect it because of being close to the uh, cache desk. We had to first define for each camera uh, which contained the cache desk, where this cache desk uh, is located, and then we could uh, Use these features, feed them, feed the decision tree with them, and uh, the predictions were quite, um, quite okay. Okay. Uh, did you use two D mapping to do how uh, how far from, for example, cache desk the object is, or three D? Uh, to be honest, I don't remember what was the final uh, what was the final feature. I think uh, could have been two D. Would make more okay. sense. Okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, you mentioned improvement ideas. Uh, are you going to continue with the project? Uh, well, for, for sure, we see that there is a business need for this kind of mm -hmm. uh, systems. So we have uh, some customer who's potentially interested in this topic. So this is actually where, why we started working on this in this direction. And uh, there is a quite high chance that uh, this will be continued as a, uh, let's say, real project. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Okay, Arthur, thank you very much for the presentation.